chairperson and uh, Navla sir for having me. In. Now, after having learned uh, how to interpret the graph that is there in front of when we do PM, I'm going to take you through cases. Some of most of them are real, but one of them is for understanding how the thing. So let's go ahead. There is no funding or support from anybody for this, apart from Diabetes India, which has got me here. I think uh, rather than disclaimer, it's of an appreciation that we are talking about this. These are the things that are currently available in India. There are some others which are not very commonly used, not very famous, which are not very popular and which are not used. But these are the things that are still in practice that we are using. The metronic things are good, but they are they are used in shorter terms and they are costlier than the Abbott uh, devices. The most common device that we probably use in professional CGM category is Abbott's Libre Pro, where the sensor is available for the patient and the reader is available only for the healthcare practice, the doctor. The doctor has to spend one time six, seven thousand rupees by the reader. And every time the patient comes, the patient can buy only a sensor so that uh, it becomes cost effective right? because the topic was what is there for India and what we can do. The cost is very high then we because people are paying from our pocket. So I think this is the most common thing that is used as a pro. Yeah, the Abbott's Libre Pro, the sensor costs somewhere around 2,500 rupees for the patient. And the reader costs somewhere around 7,000 for the doctor which is for once uh, in lifetime. Now, when it comes to case-based discussion, I have categorized them into four categories where there are cases and we know what is the indication of putting. Because interpretation is as good as how what you're looking for. The beauty is in the uh, eyes of the person who is seeing it. So first we know why we are doing the CGM, then the interpretation becomes very easy. So there are four categories why we do a professional CGM, reference AGP, clinical outcomes, diagnostic and intervention. Reference, diagnostic outcomes and interventional. So the cases in category one, reference, is there a problem? Category two, diagnostic, what is the problem? Category three, cases in intervention, the, what, what will be the intervention, whether de-escalation of medication or behavioral modification, Escalation of medication, depending on what we see in the diagnostic, uh, this thing. And clinical outcome, has the problem resolved by what you have done? It not only for you to see whether the problem is resolved or not, but it is to show the patient that the problem is resolved, which increases the trust of the patient on you and your treatment. So category one, um, uh, why the black box is not coming there, the patient's not in. Sorry, but um, there is a patient who is on metformin and glimepiride 2 mg to ice a day and uh, some antidepressant medication. HbA1c 6.8 patient is constantly complaining of tiredness, weak, doesn't feel interested in doing anything. When we do a, a professional CGM, this is a seven day professional CGM. As you can see, there is a dip every time here and then followed by hyperglycemia. So even though the HbA1c looking at Point that we might feel that she has a very good control, the tiredness, the lack of interest for which she was put on antidepressants could be because of constant hypoglycemia and after a certain while we know patient's body adopts to hypoglycemia. So it may not give the classical uh, autonomic uh, sympathetic symptoms of hunger, sweating and everything and many of time our patients are also known to uh, give credit of all these symptoms to their own voluntary lack of interest or depression or anything like that. So somebody whose HbA1c is very tightly controlled and who is on sulfonylureas, there is a reason to see if there is a problem. If somebody is on sulfonylurea, HbA1c below 7 is classical reason for a professional CGM to see whether hypoglycemia is happening or not. So is there a problem? The first category of medication. Now because I saw a 7 days, showed you a 7 days graph, let's see whether professional CGM can be used as a modified or a cheaper version of continuous, real-time continuous glucose monitoring. Can we keep on seeing, can we ask the patient to come every day? So definitely not for first three days because if you see the three days graph and when the same person comes back seven days, this is the AGP at third day, this is the AGP at seven day and you can clearly see they are not same. 
so we cannot do that on third day for sure what about seventh day and 14th day i think personally even though the, uh, the manufacturing company does not recommend seven day graft and 14 days graft are slightly acceptably similar so we can see agp at seventh day for the first time rather than asking the patient to come directly at 14th day even though the monitor is going to work for 14 days sometimes for making patients um, reasonable to pay for the thing uh, that is costing them 2500 i do call them at seventh day and see what is happening take a prediction do minor changes in the medication if we can do on seventh day and then come back after 14th day but in reality the 30 day profile matches you can see every first day third day seventh day 14th day so 30 day profile matches exactly to the 14 day profile so it is recommended that agp that is ambulatory glucose profile dr chavla said right now uh, requires 14 day collection of data but we can reasonably i feel do it at seventh day once coming to case 2 what is the problem we saw case 1 Sulfonylurea, too tight control of HbA1c, AGP is indicated. Case 2, how to identify a problem when you are doing AGP? So, 18-year girl, type 1 diabetes on basal bolus therapy of insulin with lantus twice and uh, epidra thrice. Clinical concern is poor control, poor follow-up, HbA1c very high, not coming back, not doing glucometer readings, not doing uh, real-time continuous glucose monitoring. And this is our graph. So, at first, we can see that all the blood glucose is high, but still, still there is some hypoglycemia. So, how do we go ahead with interpreting? And this is the AGP that sir also showed. I am going to apologize because some slides are going to get repeated from sir's graph. But that was exactly the, um, the idea that sir says about how we use it. And then in a clinical case, how do we interpret? So, the first thing to look is the time in range, time above range, time below range. You can see 75-7% readings above, 18% reading in range, and the time below range is also around 5%. This is where you look, time above in range, above range, and below range. Now, this just an example of how we are going to look at it. So, sir said we need to look at exposure, variability, stability, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. Sir has clearly explained this, I will not go back into it, but what we need to do is, we need to look at a scorecard approach. This is, even though cumbersome and not possible for every patient, very good for process of training. If you do 10 patients with this, for 11th patient, you might not have to do everything, you will realize what is to be done. But for initial 10 patients, if you do this, will give you a clear idea as to next time, like sir said, you can look at the ECG and say where is the block. But till then, if there is a systematic approach where we can go, this is called a scorecard where we value exposure, variability, variability within the 25th or uh, 75th centile, within 10, 19th centile, instability and risk of hypoglycemia. And there is a scorecard where we can do 8 hours sections and say within this 8 hours, what was the exposure, what was the variability, what was the interdocile variability, what was the stability, what was the hypoglycemia. So for this given patient, scorecard was measured. He had exposure very high all the time. Variability was very high all the time. Variability 10, 19 centile was very high. Instability was high at some times, but stably before lunch he had hypoglycemia. So that is one point of intervention that will correct the whole profile so this this is a predictable problem and these are unpredictable and variable problems so we'll see how and what interventions are going to be useful so the primary observation is high overall exposure high variability erratic instability secondary hypo risk relates to uh, variability and uh, instability so you will most likely see a hypoglycemia before the highest exposure of hypoglycemia in most given patient. That is why, sir, as sir said, the first thing is not to reduce the exposure. The first aim of treatment is to stop hypoglycemia. That means stop the variability. Once the variability is gone, the stability comes up very easily. Now, uh, sir has explained these slides, but for this patient, what we did, that is what I will come down to. 
So at a patient like this, another exposure variability, variability, stability, hypoglycemia, exposure uh, scorecard. Now we are going to see clinically how this is different and what we need to do. This is mostly a graph of poor behavior. When there is a high variability, it's a graph of a poor behavior. And when there is high instability, it is a graph of poor physiology. So this will most probably require behavioral modification. And this is going to require modification in the medication. And that is where we have identified or diagnosed a problem. High inter uh, quartile and interdecile variability means that the patient is taking different kinds of meal every day, different amount of carbohydrate every day, different timings of the meal every day, different kind of exercise every day. Whatever kind of change in the medications you do, this is very difficult to get corrected unless the behavioral modification is uh, advised. If you are coming with someone like this where the exposure is high but the snake is very thin, this means that there is a predictable problem in the physiology of the patient, uh, the insulin secretion uh, deficiency or insulin resistance, and this will strongly require change in the medication. The same patient, when behavioral modification was done, the graph came, the HbA1c came from 10 to 8.5, and as you can see, the exposure variability and um, stability has improved. This was without changing any insulin doses, without changing any uh, uh, type of insulin. This was just with the mid behavioral modification. You can see the type 1 patient from the large python, it has come down to a snake, even though the snake is still at a higher level. Now here I can talk about change in the insulin dose with the patient, where I can reduce down the exposure. So that was about diagnostic. Then we are coming to the next group of patients. The patient is on, patient, young patient, started on insulin during the pregnancy and continued on insulin after the pregnancy and never came back to follow up. She's taking short acting insulin once in a while. So she was ex, uh, advised long acting insulin. She's not taking it and came with HbA1c of 12.4. This is fear of uh, getting more insulin because of which she is just not coming back. When she came, her HbA1c was 12.4. A young patient, obese, uh, on irregular insulin, currently not pregnant and not planning to uh, um, plan pregnancy. She was put on basal insulin and oral anti-diabetes medication. Now I'm worried because this patient is on only insulin and I'm putting her on uh, oral anti-diabetes. I'm worried that she might have ketoacidosis. Might be type 1, which is not... Uh, which will have problems if I put her on oral antidiabetes. And you can see that this was to start with, and as the time went on, her blood sugars were fine. So this is a confidence for me within seven days to look at multiple readings and making sure that the patient and the treatment is on the right path. So we saw diagnostic, we saw interventional. Let's see clinical outcomes. Somebody who was on multiple medication, uh, uh, repeatedly having hypoglycemia, change to other medications, improving. So if we see, show this to the patient, the patient's trust and confidence in this, it's important to document and show the clinical outcome to the patient, apart from two being happy. Somebody who is uh, ejection fraction 10% on pre-mixed insulin, getting recurrent, uh, even though the blood sugar is controlled, I wanted to add on an SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is what is on 16 and 14 mixed insulin. And this is just on empagliflozin 5 mg. So these are the changes that bring confidence to you as well as patient. Meal management, like sir said, somebody who is just on metformin and um, gliptin. This is the graph and you can guess this at 11 o'clock, this is at 5 o'clock. So guess this speaks are half cup of tea and one toast or one biscuit. That is what is giving this peak and all the time above range. And once that is stopped, that there is a flat line. So these are the very important behavioral um, problems that can be identified and solved very easily. As you can see, when the patient is started on medication, it's going to take time. So the patient might start showing improvement only at the end of the AGP if you look at the daily graph. 
somebody who is HbA1c 6.4, he is on metformin, sulfonylurea or metformin and HGLT2 inhibitors, just to say everything is okay. Coming back to the summary, we saw cases in the reference range. Uh, is there a problem? When to identify a problem or when to start thinking of using a professional system? Somebody who is on agents which can cause hypoglycemia and a very strict control of HbA1c, see if there is a problem. Then we have seen diagnostic, the graph, variability, exposure, scorecard, everything, everything, to see what is the problem. Then find a solution. The solution might be as simple as stopping the toast and then identify the, pro uh, suggest the intervention and see what is the outcome of the intervention and show to the patient that this is the outcome of the intervention which will increase the patient's trust. With that, I would like to thank the organizers and those who are really interested in topic and sitting in the hall <laughs> and would be eager to uh, hear the next presentation. Thank you so much.